to ask uh, Gary Calkins to switch on the camera. Gary, it's about your presentation, those uh, driving forces, eight forces for data-driven FPNA. Gary, you're welcome. The stage is yours. Great, thank you. So let's go to my first slide. I always enjoy this cartoon, drowning in data, but starving for information. You have this poor beleaguered clerk, sad, shoulders hunched, paper all around him, and the supervisor in the doorway to the left is asking him, looks like you've got all the data. What is the holdup? You know, I gave you the request this morning. How come you don't have the answer this afternoon? And the message here is there's a difference between data and information. Data typically is transactional, payroll systems and like, you convert data into information. So next slide. The reason I wanna have these eight forces is because FP&A methods have been around for decades, some arguably even before computers. So why is there interest in it? I'll quickly go through these eight. The first is executive frustration with strategy failure. Most executives are quite good at formulating strategy. Their big frustration is failure to successfully implement it. There's actually a fair amount of empirical evidence. Um, there's a Chicago-based, and I'm a native of Chicago, uh, consulting firm that monitors the involuntary turnover of CEOs in North America. It's increasing every year. And I think the reason is post Enron, board of directors, no longer ceremonial. You know, if a CEO is not basically implementing the strategy, or then they are terminated. Carly Fiorini at Hewlett Packard is a good example. Number two, increased accountability. Today, there is no place to hide. Managers and employee teams will be monitored. They will be measured. It doesn't necessarily mean their jobs are at risk, but it could adversely impact their promotability, promotions, salary increases. Number three, more rapid decision making. Unlike a few years ago, when you could test and learn and have meetings and conference rooms, today people will be on the phone, go or no go, yes or no. They have to make decisions in near real time. They almost wish an executive was sitting next to them and said, you know, what decision should I make that aligns with your strategy? And incidentally, back to number one, how do you solve this? The how is through the strategy map and balance scorecard. Many of you are familiar with uh, Professor Robert S. Kaplan, Harvard Business School, and Dr. David Norton. That is basically one of the many good effective techniques for strategy management, strategy implementation. All right, number four mistrust of the management accounting system for accuracy and transparency. The reality is most managers do not trust the management accounting system. I'm not talking about external financial reporting, that's for statutory compliance with government regulatory agencies. I'm talking about the management accounting system for insights and decisions. And the reason they don't trust it is because of those overhead allocations. Most accountants allocate costs, if you will, product service lines, like spreading butter across bread. They use factors in manufacturing, like number of labor hours, or in other businesses, number of sales amount, units produced, square feet, square meter, headcount. None of those allocation factors reflect the unique re consumption relationship that the services and products basically consume of those expenses. So what's the how-to, the solution? Activity-based costing. And I know many of you say, oh, ABC, it's too big, it's too complicated. That was a problem in the 1970s and 80s. There are techniques now to implement ABC in two to three weeks, right-sizing them. Number five, poor customer value management. Customers are the source of value creation for financial wealth creation of shareholders and owners. And the problem is many, if you will, customers view their suppliers as offering commodities. Banks all have the same type of depository accounts and the like. Um, therefore, for a supplier to be competitive, they need to provide differentiated services to different segments of customers. Not all of them are doing it well. And the CFO has to basically help out. They need to basically calculate not just up to the product gross profit margin line, but include the expenses below the line, channel of distribution expenses, selling expenses, marketing expenses, customer service expenses, to create basically a profit and loss statement for each customer. 
because the sales and marketing teams are always asking the question, which type of customer is most attractive to retain, to grow, to win back and acquire? Which types are not? How much should we spend? Price discounts, coupons, offers, and deals. Number six, contentious budgeting, poor resource capacity planning. This may surprise you. I think the annual budget process is broken. It's out of date in a couple of months after it's published, caves into the loudest voice and strongest muscle, those veteran you know, managers are now to sandbag it. And that technique of spreadsheets, you know, incrementing at one or 2% for inflation, whatever. And then when you give it to the executives, they don't like that number, go change the number. So you change it up, down, up, down, up, down. You almost wish the executive tell me what number did you want in the first place? However, the FP&A methods are more volume sensitive. This is my industrial engineering, I think second semester freshman year at Cornell University. You basically have to do capacity planning. There's the formula, the forecast volume and mix of the products and services times the unit level cost consumption rate equals the capacity required, the number of type of employees with their salary and wages, spending with suppliers. So you need to think like an engineer. Seven, dysfunctional supply chain management. This may not apply to everybody unless you're in the supply chain, but the issue is this. Most customers view their suppliers as the enemy. It's an adversarial relationship. They will pound on their supplier to negotiate lower prices. If they put the supplier out of business, so what? We can always get another supplier. That's got to stop. It needs to be a marriage of all the trading partners along the supply chain because supply chains are competing against other supply chains for share of wallet, share of purse. So they need to collaborate to identify mutually beneficial projects and initiatives that will save money for both trading partners, all the trading partners. And finally, number eight, unfulfilled return on investment promises from large IT systems like enterprise resource planning systems, ERP, or customer relationship management systems. And the issue here is, if you ask an IT director, chief information officer, three years after they just finished implementing a large ERP system, if you ask them, how well do you believe the return on investment met or exceeded what that ERP software salesman sold you on three years ago, many of them will be hard pressed to say yes. They'll say, golly, we just spent three years putting this thing in. <clears throat> I'm not sure we've got the payback. That does not mean you should not implement it. You must implement ERP systems to remain competitive. But the problem is they produce a lot of data, but not necessarily the information. And we basically, when we talk about being data driven, we're really talking about using that data to convert it to information for insights and making better decisions. You know, remember this, in the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. But usually the biggest opinion wins, which is the opinion of the boss or the boss of the boss. So to the degree they're making decisions on gut feel or intuition or flawed and misleading information, the organization is at risk.